everything that's wrong with the TPP's digital policy rules, namely that those rules are put there for and by the corporate interests that are privy to these secret negotiations at the expense of users and the public interest. Now, James, I feel compelled to note again, as a mainstream media charade is playing out right now here in the States, that this is precisely the kind of news that Brian Williams or Jon Stewart have not and will not report on. We've been covering the TPP on New World Next Week since at least 2013, and even in 2012, Slate called the TPP, quote, the most important trade agreement that we know nothing about. And I would say the very reason many people know nothing about the TPP is because those most trusted newsmen are fronts for the very same multinational corporations that, well, you know, James. Yeah, exactly right. And let me build a bit of fond farewell to, uh, or an unfond farewell to Brian Williams and uh, John Leibowitz. Let's never forget, uh, Stuart is just the stage name. And yes, exactly, they will always avoid these types of issues. So let's let's delve into these issues here. And I hope that people will go th- and click through that uh, that to that EFF link that uh, that we have in the show notes about this story because they have that link to the PDF demonstrating that there is absolutely no even imaginable economic benefit to this copyright extension. And just reading from the Hargreaves report that they quote in that PDF, economic evidence is clear that the likely deadweight loss to the economy exceeds any additional incentivizing effect which might result from the extension of copyright term beyond its present levels. This is doubly clear for retrospective extension to copyright term, given the impossibility of incentivizing the creation of already existing works or work from artists already dead. So exactly right. They're they're not even, I mean, there's not even an argument to be made that this has any economic benefit on top of the fact that, as I hope my listeners will be aware, intellectual property doesn't exist. It doesn't exist anywhere except in the courts. It's not something that arises from natural law. There's no natural rights argument for intellectual property. There's no nothing in nature that says I can't play, play a chord this way on the guitar or followed by this chord, followed by this chord. It's, it's a completely artificial construction that, of course, is only there to incentivize and to, to provide economic benefits to corporations like Disney, of course, Every time Mickey Mouse is due to come into the public domain, there you go. It's uh, suddenly extended. So, uh, yes, this is, I mean, this is absolutely just another nail in the coffin of what the TPP represents and what all of these trade deals represent. And the insidious part of this, of course, is that it's being done behind the scenes. And interestingly, I just got an email from a user, uh, Richard, who emailed me to say that eBay just sent him an email asking him to send a letter to his member of Congress lobbying for supporting small business trade online and they make it sound like this e-commerce thing that they're trying to to go for but what they are actually trying to get people to do is to write their uh, to badger their congressman to to pass the trade promotion authority and customs reauthorization i'll throw in an fas.org link about this but basically this is the uh, the 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 bill under which Congress gives and cedes a lot of its authority over to the president to go and do these types of behind-the-scenes um, uh, negotiations. And, uh, of course, eBay and all the other big-name players in this want this type of legislation passed so that the president can do these secret negotiations so that these tra- trade deals can be passed. It is a complex and disgusting web. We'll throw the links in the show notes so you can go and start uh, piecing it together. But, surprise, surprise, these trade deals are absolutely designed to, uh, to not benefit you in any way shape or form only to hurt and hinder you and so that's why these must be opposed and that's why the people who will not talk about them must be exposed Mm -hmm. and and the president that you mentioned is the guy who who just went on television and noted well sometimes we have to twist countries arms to get them to do what we want to do so replace countries with corporations have the as the corporations mostly have and you you get a lot of truth coming out james and i think a lot of the things that we try to put on the record with the New World Next Year 2015 episode, I think, as we're looking at them as 2015 rolls on, the trade deals, the exposure of corrupt so-called leaders, I think, continues apace. And that EFF article, as you know, it does have a lot of great info in there. I, I just kept to the to the main points germane to this episode. But again, in, in all the cases, follow the links, go do more research for yourself. James, our second story this week comes from globalresearch.ca, an article written by M. Oliver Haydorn, The Case to Reinstate the Bank of Canada. There's a really interesting legal case playing out in Canada at the moment where concerned citizens and a group called the Committee for Monetary and Economic Reform 
filed a lawsuit back in December 2011 in federal court to try and force a restoration of the Bank of Canada to its mandated purposes. In essence, they want the Bank of Canada to provide interest-free loans to the federal, provincial, and municipal governments as provided for in the Bank of Canada Act. This money would be used to finance public expenditures whenever there's a budgetary deficit. Apparently, the federal government used to borrow interest-free, to at least some extent, from the Bank of Canada up until 1974. But at present, governments borrow all of the necessary money, apart from any bonds they might sell to the public, from private banks at the going rate of interest. Canadians are economically burdened with the resultant debt servicing charges because the Bank of Canada does not make use of its prerogatives in the interest of the Canadian public. Their case is being prosecuted by Rocco Galati, who's widely considered to be Canada's top constitutional lawyer. So we can break a lot of this down, and the lawsuit has been explained on our man Dan Dick's website, pressfortruth.ca, in the following terms. Two Canadians and a Canadian economic think tank confront the global financial powers in the Canadian federal court. The Canadians plead for declarations that would restore the use of the Bank of Canada for the benefit of Canadians and remove it from the control of international private entities whose interests and directives are placed above the interest of Canadians and the primacy of the Constitution of Canada. Now, James, this sounds a hell of a lot like the same situation we kind of have here in the States, where a Federal Reserve loans all of the money to the Congress, despite the fact Congress has the constitutional right and duty to print the money, right, James? Well, yes, it, 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 it's functioning in the same way, but the Bank of Canada is actually a different beast entirely because the, the Federal Reserve was created specifically as this private banking cartel, and that's what it is at its core. The Bank of Canada is actually a public a public utility. It's just not being used that way. The uh, the private banks are making the money as uh, debt money. So this, this is important because, at the very least, this does offer Canadians uh, a way into the conversation about monetary reform and what type of monetary system we want in the first place. But you mentioned Dan Dix and Press for Truth, who've been doing the uh, yeoman's work on this for the last four years since this lawsuit was first kicked off. And I will direct people to his most recent video on this uh, Canada versus, uh, sorry, Comer versus the Bank of Canada, where he lays this out, I think, in the exact terms that I would, which is to say, I, you know, it's it's a good thing that this is happening. It's a good thing it's proceeding, and it's a, it, it, it. However, this eventuates, and let's let's keep this in perspective. All that's been granted is the ability for this lawsuit to go ahead. I mean, nothing's been won at this point. So let's let's uh, temper our our happiness at this point. But still, having said that, even if this goes ahead, and even if it does go through, and the Bank of Canada is used to issue uh, debt-free money to the, the, the government again, is that really ultimately what we want? Is that the be-all and end-all of this situation? And uh, I, I would answer, as D Dan, uh, I think, points out it with a lot of detail in his video, the answer is not really. I mean, it, it would be better than having the banksters directly controlling the money supply, but it's not that much better, unless you believe that a Harper or a Justin Trudeau or whoever is the next goon to get into political office is going to be a better steward of the public trust than the banksters. They are just puppets of the banksters, and and, um, the idea that this is going to be used solely for good, you know, infrastructure projects and sunshine and rainbows and puppy dogs, and the politicians will be very cl clear and very, very careful not to create inflation. Uh, they'll be very good about that, right? Of course not. Um, it will just be a big meal ticket for whatever politician can offer the uh, the public the most out of this money from nothing. So I think the real answer is, as always, uh, fr a truly free competition in uh, in currencies. Why is the Bank of Canada? the one that gets to determine the, the economic, the monetary reality for the country. Why isn't it left up to, uh, to everyone to compete uh, equally? And, uh, and why do we have these uh, laws that de determine what currency really is? So I think that's the deeper issue. Again, I'll throw people to Dan Dix for, uh, for that examination. And hopefully I will be getting an interview on this um, from someone involved with the lawsuit sometime in the near future. Back when this started in 2011, I tried and tried and tried to get anyone uh, to do an interview about this and no one ever responded to me. So hopefully I've got a lead this time. So I hope this will turn out differently, but we'll see. Anyway, um, if anyone is out there who has any 
contact with Comer or these people, please get them in touch with me and we'll set something up and uh, we'll see where it goes from here. So uh, again, I think this is an important window into the monetary reform conversation for Canadians. So at least let's use it for that and get the word out about this, uh, this issue and how it affects the average Canadian. $20 billion a year in interest paid to the money that's being loaned to the Canadian government that doesn't need to have interest at, uh, on it at all. James, let's throw in one other economic note on this story, too, on this New World Next Week. HSBC tax dodge revelations are just... 